Okay, so how many people do we have on? So right now you've got uh, eight people on, and okay. usually uh, we see some more sign on about 15 after the hour. So um, okay. anybody who just joined, welcome. Um, this is a Neurotology Eastern Region virtual education series, and uh, today we're hosting Dr. Kareem Tafik from uh, University of Vanderbilt, who will be talking about hearing preservation surgery for uh, vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma. Uh, super excited to have you. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Tafik. I'll hand it over. Thanks, Mallory. Um, so I, uh, this is going to be a talk that focuses obviously on he's hearing preservation surgery for these tumors. Um, I tried to make this talk really practical. I tried to think about what were the things that were most interesting and uh, most unfamiliar to me when I was first starting to learn about this topic, um, uh, concepts, um, predictors of success, technical challenges, um, how do you do this surgery, what, is, what, do you, what special equipment do you need, um, and what's, you know, the philosophy behind it. Um, and how what you know how does this fit into the like larger context of the way we manage these tumors in these patients and what are some of the post-operative issues you can run into so i'm going to cover all of that and um i'm going to focus mostly on middle fossa um, and that's a byproduct of my training and my own preferences for doing hearing preservation surgery in these tumors um uh, but We'll also talk a little bit about the retrosigmoid approach. Um, and, you know, I don't think that it's really, it's going to make a lot of sense to cover the basic epidemiology of these tumors. Uh, we'll just skip right ahead and we'll talk about um, what I think is a nice way to sort of set us up for talking about where hearing preservation surgery fits into the larger scheme of management of these tumors. So I think one of the most sort of exemplary studies of um, the natural history of hearing in patients who have acoustic neuromas, regardless of their size, right? So if you have a patient who comes in with an acoustic and still has good hearing, what are the chances that that patient's going to lose serviceable hearing um, within a certain time frame? I think that's that's a really important question, right? It's something that we all think about. It's something that our patients need to know about. Um, and I think this is probably the most exemplary study of what happens with time. So this is a, a series by Jake Hunter. This was um, a multi-center sort of cohort study. This was uh, retrospective, and it was uh, looking at cohorts from Mayo and uh, Vandy, and uh, took 466 patients who came in with serviceable hearing and uh, diagnosis of an acoustic, and these are, were all patients that were followed over time. So by 10 years, 44% um, of these patients who started out with serviceable hearing, meaning class A or B hearing, word recognition score greater than 50%, PTA better than 50 decibels. They declined to class C or D hearing within 10 years, 44% of the time. Or I'm sorry, they, uh, they, they only 44% of them maintain class A or B hearing. So 66% will lose serviceable hearing over time. So what is your prognosis of maintaining good hearing? Uh, uh, what, what are some predictors of that? So having a good word recognition score, good PTA at the outset, um, there's been some evidence that uh, rapid growth is a poor predictor of hearing preservation if you're uh, going to have your tumor observed. Age and gender uh, and tumor size have been pretty consistently shown to not be predictors. And that's why we see patients who have four centimeter tumors and uh, amazingly they'll still have good hearing. Um, uh, that's also why we'll see two millimeter tumors uh, in patients who have a dead ear, uh, ipsilateral to the tumor. There's really no consistent relationship between tumor size and uh, hearing preservation. What uh, we think happens in these tumors, and we don't know why some tumors do this and others don't, but um, Christina Stankovic, who's now at uh, Stanford, 
um, showed while she was still at Mass Ioneer showed that if you um, culture tumor cells from patients who have lost hearing, um, uh, the tumor cells seem to be that they create these extracellular vesicles, right? And if you if you take this whatever the substance is with those vesicles and you assess what they do to the cochlear cells, it turns out that they're injurious to the cochlea. So we think that the that the tumors that rob patients of their hearing uh, are doing that not because not so much because of a cr compressive phenomenon, but there's some evidence that th there may actually be a molecular biological reason for um, for hearing loss in tumor patients. And that might account for why we see, you know, decreased uh, T2 signal, increased flare signal in the cochlea of patients who have uh, diminished hearing uh, with their acoustics. So here's a study looking at gamma knife and hearing preservation, kind of switching gears now and looking at what's the hearing preservation rate uh, after you gamma knife somebody. So uh, this is just, uh, these are just a couple of studies, but, you know, it, it looks like the the this is not a good hearing preservation strategy. I'm sure to many of you this is not going to be a surprise, but um, so study number one on top, 44% rate of hearing preservation at 10 years uh, following uh, gamma knife radiation. The bottom study is one of the only like large scale series uh, looking at hearing preservation rates beyond 10 years after radiation, and in this case, the rate of hearing preservation at 15 years was 12%. And of course, there's some variability, right? There, there's, there are different uh, doses uh, the, of radiation that, that you can you know, program into your treatment plan, uh, and, and that probably has some bearing on uh, whether hearing uh, is going to be preserved, also the proximity of the tumor to the cochlea. But generally speaking, if you have an intracanalicular tumor, um, uh, and and you're going to commit the patient to radiation, there's a good chance that that patient is going to lose hearing uh, within 10, 15 years of radiation. It's, it's generally not thought to be a good hearing preservation strategy at all. So what about hearing preservation surgery? That's, that's, what's, that's what the focus of this talk is going to be. So the two options, of course, are middle FOSS and retro SIG. Those are the two approaches that allow us to preserve our inner ear architecture. In general, favorable predictors for hearing preservation, for surgical hearing preservations, are going to be small tumor size and excellent hearing preoperatively. So there's also um, some evidence. We do, so I did, I did this study um, looking at a cohort of patients from uh, Kaiser, Southern California. This was uh, Robert uh, Bob Cueva's um, uh, series, and uh, we looked at ten years worth of hearing preservation surgery done by a retrosig approach. And this was uh, uh, over one hundred forty patients uh, who had received uh, a retrosigmoid approach for hearing preservation, and these were generally tumors less than two centimeters in size. And uh, if I remember right, I think the average tumor size was somewhere around 11 millimeters. So these are not big tumors generally. Um, but if you, it turns out, uh, if you if you look at patients who had any history of sudden hearing loss that either rebounded or was just not bad enough to disqualify them from having a um, hearing preservation surgery, versus patients who uh, didn't have a history of sudden hearing loss, and maybe instead they had uh, progressive hearing loss, but in general they still had hearing that was good enough to uh, qualify them for a hearing preservation surgery if that's what they wanted. Um, and it turned out that in the group of patients that had had a sudden hearing loss, but either rebounded or, you know, maintained hearing within the class A, B, C range. We, we included patients with class C hearing. So those are patients that have PTA worse than 50, but still have a word recognition score better than 50%. Um, so 62% rate of hearing preservation in those patients versus 41% in patients who did not have a history of sudden hearing loss. So that's interesting. You think, uh, at first glance, you think, well, why would that be? And 
you know, I think the reason may be that there's something about those patients who have suffered an injury to the cochlea um, and still maintain serviceable hearing. There's something about them that's different from uh, from other patients. There, I don't know if it's genetics. I don't know if it's environmental. But you know, you think about how little we know about why this you know phenomenon occurs. Um, it it it, ter- it may be that the same um, mechanism that's preventing those patients from losing a, a large amount of their hearing is also protective against the stress of surgery. Uh, of course, it's difficult to prove that, right? But it's an interesting phenomenon. It could just be a fluke, certainly, but um, it's it's uh, something that I think somebody uh, in this audience uh, should should try to replicate and so should try to study on their own. So if you if you do that, let me know because I'm curious what what somebody else is going to find. But anyhow, so uh, I'm going to skip through this slide because I'm sure you guys know this. This is just uh, sort of summarizing what hap- the relationship between sudden loss and diagnosis of an acoustic. Um, so let's talk now about middle fossa. Uh, I love this this illustration on the left. Um, so with a middle fossa approach, of course, we're looking from a superior vantage inferiorly against the superior surface of the temporal bone. So we're looking here at a left temporal bone. Here's your um, house urban retractor that's sort of uh, lifting the temporal dura, lobe dura up. Here's your arcuate eminence, which approximates, but not imperfectly approximates, the location of your superior semicircular canal. And basically, the meat of this operation is going to be medial to that, anteromedial to that superior semicircular canal. <clears throat> kind of shown in relief, if you will, is um, the IAC, the facial nerve is going to course inferiorly, as we all know and take a curve that represents the labyrinthine segment of the nerve. And, and then it's going to take a sharp turn backward and become the tympanic segment. And at the junction between the two, it's going to send off the GSPN antero immediately along the floor of the middle fossa. And uh, the cochlea is just anterior uh, and medial to that labyrinthine segment. And so, you know, the, the difficult part of this operation, well, there are, there are numerous difficult parts of it, but one of the challenges is that early on in the case, the only landmarks you have are the, the uh, arcuate eminence and the GSPN, and oftentimes you don't have either of those two structures, right? Sometimes there's the arcuate eminence is diminutive, um, and you just have, you know, a flat plate of bone, and you'll have a GSPN that's encased in bone. And so that, that I think, is, is one of the reasons that um, that some people who, especially people who have not seen this approach a lot, they shy away from it. Um, and it's very understandable, but, um, I'll show you how we like to do our middle fossa approaches. Um, so this is a standard sort of question mark shaped incision. Um, we bring that descending limb just in front of the tragus. And, you know, when we mark this incision now, we always feel for the, um, zygomatic root and make sure that we're bringing our incision low enough to uh, for us to expose that uh, zygomatic uh, root and we'll we have our ABR uh, monitoring um, and we'll we'll kind of put some bone wax around this uh, this uh, stimulating electrode and then we'll put mast saw and tegaderm to sort of um, uh, close it off from the rest of the um, uh, field and we'll do a strip shave for, for individuals with long hair. Uh, and uh, for, for people who have short hair, we'll just, shave, uh, we'll just shave the temporal scalp. So when we do, um, so we have our skin flap, we've lifted up a, a temporalis flap that sort of parallels the skin incision line. So that same sort of question mark shaped incision that's you know, offset from the skin incision by about a centimeter. And uh, the way we like to do our bony craniotomy is kind of like in the, a sh- the shape of a sand disc. So, and the reason for that is, you know, it, it'll be variable, but you'll have some patients where the mastoid air cells creep up quite high and you can kind of avoid some of them by, by, um, uh, by you know, kind of making this, uh, this uh, trapezoidal shape, if you will, 
and um, just avoiding those mastoid air cells. But of course, you know, you you can drill down there if you feel like you need to. This that part of the exposure is really doesn't hinder having that bone stay there doesn't hinder you in any way because most of the work is medial. Um, and after you remove your bone flap, you wax the air cells, you wax them again on your way out. Um, but uh, uh, we'll kind of show you how this uh, looks on the inside here in a moment. But to kind of set us up, I'll talk to you about a case. Here's a woman uh, with a seven millimeter right sided intracanalicular acoustic and dizziness. And she was uh, referred to me by someone else. And um, she had been followed by that individual for quite some time, didn't have a growing tumor, but was really annoyed by vertigo, imbalance, dizziness, um, and uh, wanted something done about this. Uh, so the individual who referred her um, uh, uh, said, you know, she's, she's, she wants this out and she's really dizzy. Um, so we, you know, she still had excellent hearing, of course, Here's her tumor on on the uh, uh, in the right eye. It's kind of um, central. It's kind of centered in the uh, on the porous. It's, there's not really much tumor extending out lateral, but so you can see this fundal cap of fluid, uh, several millimeters of fluid. Um, there's some controversy as to whether having a fundal cap is a a, a, a good prognostic uh, factor or not, but. Uh, and I don't know how to feel about that, frankly. I'd be curious to hear from uh, uh, Teddy and uh, Dr. Meyer what what you guys uh, feel about that. Well, we can talk about that um, in a few moments. Um, but I'll show you I'll show you what this looks like. We decided to take out her tumor um, with the intent of saving her hearing and uh, relieving her of her dizziness. So this is a right middle fossa approach. So we start by lifting up the temporal lobe dura. Uh, we find the uh, superior petrosal sinus. You can you kind of see that bluish hue there. We're coming up on the arcuate eminence, and now we're dissecting the dura off the GSPN anteriorly. And, you know, if you think about like the medial lateral depth of the arcuate eminence, if you find that first and then creep forward, uh, that's that's a good sort of approximator uh, as to where you should expect to find the GSPN. So now we're kind of delivering um, the uh, superior petrosal sinus from the, uh, you know, the the false ridge and then the true ridge, and now we're putting our uh, house urban retractor posterior to the true ridge, and starting to drill our trough. We're going just medial to that blue line, superior semicircular canal. I like to blue line it. You don't have to. You can see the blue line there. And we're deepening our trough. We found the dura of the IAC. So we uh, drill our posterior trough. We drill our anterior trough. We kind of just sequentially deepen both of them. Um, it's important, I think, to drill out that postmedial triangle because that's where you're going to deliver your tumor when you're dissecting it away from the facial nerve. So now I'm uh, de deepening the anterior trough, anterior to the porous. And you notice I'm, I haven't really drilled much bone here at all, laterally. Um, I think as a general rule of thumb, it's a good idea to not drill anterior to the IAC um, more than one half of the way out lateral. So but that's where your cochlea is going to live, right? Uh, your cochlea is going to be anterior to the IAC, particularly anterior to the fundus of the IAC. But it's a conservative rule of thumb, and it's a, I think because it's conservative, it's a, it's useful uh, and it's um, uh, it, it's safe. Um, so if you commit to not drilling out lateral um, when you're uh, more than halfway out the length of the IAC, you're probably going to be safe. You are going to be safe. And when we when we're sort of committing to uh, drilling out this area and finding the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, the way that we like to do that is we use a right angle instrument and we palpate between the dura and the uh, anterior wall of the IAC. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of scooting that right angle instrument, facing it anterior and kind of assessing how much of a of a bony ledge do I have? I want to be flush with the anterior portion of the IAC as I'm uh, as I'm um, moving my dissection out lateral toward the fundus. Um, 
And the reason for that is that if you commit to that technique, then you're going to end up skating right along the um, uh, the course of the labyrinthine segment. And you'll see that in just a moment. So now I'm removing more of that bone that I just, you know, identified as being. Uh, uh, and then again, I'm using that right angle instrument coming out lateral. And I'm sort of delineating the expected course of the facial. And then I'm going to follow it out. I like to take this dissection far out lateral, even for a case like this where it's a more medial tumor. I think it just helps with the dissection. And then the rule of thumb is if you're going to follow the labyrinthine out, you want to drill, you want to expose about one half. So if you take your labyrinthine segment and half the length of it, that's the amount of the superior vestibular nerve you want to expose. And actually for this patient, it looked like I kind of blue lined her vestibule. So this was a this was a pretty lateral exposure. Um, also, your cochlea is never going to be superior. Your basal turn is never going to be superior to the level of the roof of your IAC. So that that uh, knowing that enables you to kind of uh, saucerize this area and um, feel more comfortable as you're kind of following that labyrinthine segment out toward the geniculate, which is going to be in this territory. Or here we left the geniculate bone covered. So now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to conf confirm with a stimulator that we've we're right on against our facial. We, we're opening up the tumor now. We're identifying the facial, separating the tumor from the facial. The facial nerves right there. Severing the uh, what we uh, the nervous intermedius and also debulking the tumor. There's the eighth nerve. Here's the facial. So cutting superior vis, uh, presumably superior vestib, and further delineating that plane between the facial now, cutting the the lateral uh, portion of the superior vestibular nerve. And then we're kind of uh, diving more inferior. Um, now we're kind of delivering the tumor from underneath the facial kind of got that plane established on the underside of the facial nerve, so it separated that tissue so that the tumor is uh, much more mobile now, so I can easily just gently push it aside. I like to, you know, if I'm going to do that with a suction, it's going to be a safe suction, meaning a fenestrated suction or a Brackman suction rather than a, a you know, single uh, opening on the suction. Unfortunately, this tumor came out nicely. You can kind of get a hint of the, looks like, um, I think you'll get a view of the cochlear nerve here in just a moment. So uh, that's probably, uh, it's hard to tell, That might, that's probably the cochlear nerve right there. And that was, so that was the wound bed. What we do is we uh, will harvest abdominal fat. We'll wax the air cells first and then place the fat. Uh, and then we'll also take a, a piece of loose realer fascia and drape it over the, the middle fossa floor just for a security blanket, really, to make sure we minimize our risk of a CSF leak. So here's her hearing result. She did lose just a tiny bit of uh, uh, thresholds. Um, but this is class A hearing, pre-op, post-op, and she ha she had a great outcome. Facial nerve um, remained normal throughout her post-op course. So one of my favorite studies of long-term hearing preservation, because this is really one of the controversies here is if you save somebody's hearing after after metal fossa retrosig, whatever it is, um, is that is that hearing durable? There's there's been some concern that there's um, um, that it, it, it's not durable over time. Um, there have not been a lot of studies that have corrected for decline in hearing of the contralateral ear. Uh, so natural history of hearing loss or an age-related hearing loss. But this is 
probably the best long-term study we have of uh, surgical hearing preservation after acoustic neuroma resection. This is 155 patients. This is out of University of Michigan. Um, uh, so Steve Tellian was a senior author on this patient, uh, on this paper rather. 155 patients who had middle fossa resection of their acoustics and uh, their rate of immediate hearing preservation, class A and B, was 70%. And over time, they looked at uh, uh, hearing preservation as defined by AAO class, A and B. Uh, they found that only 18% of patients had hearing preservation at more than 12 years. But I'll just call your attention now that to the fact that there's a big drop off, right, between the nine to 11 year mark and the 12 year mark. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When they looked at word recognition score class, um, so basically uh, class one and two word recognition score uh, is defined by uh, word rec greater than 49%. The hearing preservation rate was much better. Um, uh, and and you know there's a there's not quite as steep of a drop off between that nine to eleven year mark and the twelve year mark uh, when you're looking at word recognition score outcomes. But and the reason to look at both is that a lot of people have argued um, that it's arguably more important that to uh, think about word recognition score when we're you're defining hearing preservation than it is to uh, look at PTA. And I know, uh, Teddy, I think you, you guys have looked at, you know, is it is it valid to think about um, uh, P, what's more important, PTA, word recognition score, uh, when you're thinking about uh, what is serviceable hearing? Uh, not so much in terms, I think you've looked at that, not so much in terms of acoustic neuroma, but just a hearing loss in general. Uh, um, love to hear from you about that um, in the discussion. But um, uh, the biggest issue with this paper, I think, is that there were only 12 patients in this 12 year follow up group. Um, so I think that probably explains why there's such a big drop off um, between the 9 to 11 year group and the 12 plus year group. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a criticism that I bring up just because we're talking about hearing preservation. We want to sort of understand what is, what is the durability. And I think that unfortunately we don't have great evidence for um, its long-term uh, uh, durability beyond the 10 year mark. But I think you can look at this nine to 11 year mark and have a little bit more faith that this is probably accurate. And you can um, probably have faith, have even more faith because multiple studies have sort of um, uh, supported this idea that hearing preservation is durable. So this was a clever study um, uh, done by uh, Goobles and one of our uh, second year and our second year fellow, Nate Cass, uh, who's going to start as a neurotologist at University of Kentucky this summer. Um, so they did this clever study where they looked at the reports in the literature and uh, they, they sort of looked at, well, OK, you if 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 you have studies with variable lengths of follow up uh, uh, that are looking at durability of hearing preservation, you would generally expect that if hearing preservation is going to decline with time, that we're going to that we're going to have studies that capture that. But we found <laughs> the that these authors found the opposite. Um, that um, the proportion of, of patients with retained serviceable hearing improved with the longer length uh, with a longer length of follow up of these studies. So it's not a perfect way to measure this, of course, uh, and nobody's saying that. The authors are not saying that, but it is. You know, completely cr contradictory to what you might expect if you believe that uh, surgical hearing preservation declines with time. So, in general, uh, favorable predictors for surgical hearing preservation: the mo two most important things are having a small tumor, ideally one that's less than 10 millimeters in maximal diameter, but you can still save hearing in a patient um, who has a 20 millimeter tumor. It's way less likely. It's so much less likely, but it's not impossible. It's been done. It's been reported uh, repeatedly. Um, uh, but in general, I think it's a much better um, option for patients who have small tumors, intracanalicular tumors, and excellent preoperative hearing in terms of both uh, PTA and worker recognition score. The, we've also looked at um, the role, people have looked at the role of uh, cochlear flare. Um, there's been some thought that 
um, uh, flare intensity might be a, uh, um, a predictor of hearing preservation. So low cochlear flare um, uh, is, is arguably a favorable prognostic indicator for surgical hearing preservation. We, we looked at, um, this was a, a study I did when I was at UCSD for fellowship. So we looked at our middle fossa surgical hearing preservation cases, and we found that high preoperative cochlear T2 signal intensity on um, Fiesta, KISS sequences um, was, was in fact a favorable uh, predictor of um, uh, less hearing loss after surgery. So the better your cochlear T2 signal, the less hearing you were going to lose uh, from hearing preservation surgery. And I, again, we think the reason for that may be that if you have sort of a muddy T2 signal or a high cochlear flare intensity, that might indicate that this tumor's um, uh, releasing, uh, you know, cytotoxic substances inside the cochlear fluids. That might be what we're seeing on, on imaging uh, with, with some of these patients who have uh, poor hearing preoperatively or who lose hearing after hearing preservation surgery. Um, so why... Why else might you want to save? Why might you want to save hearing? Well, certainly, if you do save hearing, hearing-related quality of life is much better uh, in in patients who um, who have surgical hearing preservation. Um, and what what is the chance of being able to do this? I think um, probably the best summary of um, the results you can expect from resection of small and medium tumors. So these are tumors that are, you know, up to two and a half centimeters in maximal diameter. Um, this is a patient that, this is a paper that Carlson put out with the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. This was a systematic review, evidence-based guidelines from, um, I believe it's from 2018. So this paper looked at um, evidence-based guidelines for hearing preservation after both stereotactic radio surgery and after um, surgical resection. So comparable rates of hearing preservation with both, both modalities at the 10-year mark. 25 to 50% rate of hearing preservation after radiation at 10 years, 25 to 50% at uh, all time points, two, five, and 10 years post-op after resection. But I'm going to counter that, right? Because I think the problem with that study, I mean, you got to look at these things carefully. It's a controversial subject, um, obviously. But that that series of guidelines was based on small and medium tumors. And we talked before about the fact that having a small tumor, particularly one that's intracanalicular, less than 10 millimeters in size, I I would argue that puts you in a different category. Um, for the likelihood of hearing preservation after surgery. And so what I did here, this is a paper from a review that I did looking at management of small acoustics. Um, uh, and I, we sort of cataloged all of the available studies that looked at hearing preservation surgery for acoustic neuroma. And this was um, a table sort of summarizing their complications, their facial nerve outcomes, and their hearing preservation outcomes. And what I've done is highlight the papers that report a hearing preservation rate better than 70%. And you can see that there are numerous papers that do that. Um, and I think if you start looking closely at what differentiates those papers from others, uh, it, it's pretty clear that it's all about patient selection. You know, these are these are papers that are um, that are including tumors that are small in size. Um, these are not gigantic tumors that people are resecting and reporting about. And so that's the common thread here. If you have a patient with a small tumor and excellent preoperative hearing, and they're prepared uh, and motivated uh, to have hearing saved with a surgery, I don't think it's unreasonable to offer that. Um, the reason is that if you watch and wait, at, we know that at 10 years, probably somewhere between 50 and 75% of patients will have lost serviceable hearing if they start with serviceable hearing at the time of diagnosis. And so that's a lot, that's the majority of patients. And remember that it's probably much more than this if you watch patients longer, right? So I think it's, of a special concern when you have a young patient 
who has the misfortune of having a tumor, um, but still has good hearing. You know, what's that patient's likelihood of long-term hearing preservation? What's the best strategy for preserving it? Um, and I, I would venture to, uh, to say that in some cases, depending on the tumor, depending on the patient, um, depending on the configuration of the tumor and the quality of the hearing, surgery may be the best option for that patient in terms of long hearing preservation, long-term hearing preservation. So it doesn't always go the way you want, of course. Like uh, this is a this is a patient of mine, right-sided intracanalicular acoustic doesn't look very different from the one I showed you before, um, and uh, this this person wanted to go for it and try try for a hearing preservation uh, surgery. We weren't able to save it. We preserved some thresholds, kind of a funny shaped audiogram. Uh, so we lost a good amount of middle frequency hearing. We lost a lot of low frequency hearing too. And then we, it, the, he's got this uprising sensory neural hearing loss in the high frequencies. But the nice thing about this, <laughs> I was actually amazed by this. Um, this patient came to me after surgery and said, I thought for sure we just lost everything because that's usually the way it goes. If you lose hearing, um, if your ABR goes out, you can you can expect that most of the time you're you're just gonna not ha you're gonna have a totally dead ear. But um, this patient uh, and th and this patient's ABR went out during surgery. But when he came back for follow up, actually before he came back for follow up, he sent me a message saying, I that he had gone to his car and put on his Bluetooth speakers and they paired or Bluetooth headphones. They paired with his uh, iPhone um, and he heard the Bluetooth on voice in his right ear. And I was like skeptical of that, um, but he was in tears um, about this. He was so happy about it. And he messaged me about it, uh, telling me that he was crying in his, in his car at the time he was writing me the message. And so it was like a, a very heartfelt uh, message. And it, uh, you know, it made me feel a little bit better about <laughs> the decision we'd made. But of course, you know, it would have been better if we'd been able to save his hearing uh, uh, altogether, right? But the 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 benefit is that he still has his tumor out. And I guess the, the, there's a silver lining, which is that, uh, or I shouldn't say silver lining, but there's, there's sort of a consolation, which is that he still has a cochlear nerve. Uh, we know that from his thresholds. We know that from, you know, what we saw at the time of surgery. Um, so if at any point he wanted to do a cochlear implant, that's an option for him. Um, and so I think that's another advantage of knowing how to do this. Um, you know, we're, I think for a long time, we were used to just um, having a low threshold to, to remove a cochlear nerve during a, during a resection of a tumor. Um, and now even for like a medium sized tumor and a patient who doesn't have good hearing, I will kind of practice trying to save the cochlear nerve um, because I think it's important for um, post-operative or hearing rehabilitation for a lot of these patients. Um, I think the game has kind of changed a little bit um, be, since we've started doing CIs much more regularly for single-sided deafness. And so I take the time to have that nuanced conversation with patients at the time of, you know, we're, we're thinking about all of our options. I'll talk to them about CIs, um, uh, regardless of whether they have hearing or not. Um, so, and that ends up being a tricky conversation, right? Because it's already a complicated talk. Uh, and and sometimes I'll save that conversation for, for a second appointment, a follow-up visit for watching a tumor, uh, you know, over six months, 12 months, whatever it is. Um, but you know, a lot of patients have started to ask about it too. So um, I think I, I think things are kind of changing um, fairly rapidly um, because it wasn't something that we were thinking of, you know, the short time ago during my fellowship. Um, uh, so here's here's an here's a okay. So this is a, this is another tumor. So this is another patient intracanalicular tumor, you see it doesn't quite enhance very well, um, but it's, um, I'm sorry, I gotta plug my, my computer in before it dies. Doesn't quite enhance uh, as much as the other tumors we were looking at, um, but this patient wanted her hearing safe. Can you guys still see, you guys can't see that anymore, can you? No, we see uh, the paper on pre-op sudden hearing loss. 
Okay, here, let me do this. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, it's coming in as presenter mode, but we can still see it. Okay. There. Cool? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. So here's um, that patient's hearing. So she's still got good thresholds, but a little bit of an asymmetric loss. 86% uh, word rec on the right and 100% on the left. And uh, so here's her case. This is, um, again, a right-sided tumor. So we're, our superior semicircular canal is here. And I've kind of skipped ahead to decompression of the labyrinthine segment. So cochlea is going to be here, kind of feeling for Bill's bar with the right angle hook. Go ahead and opening things up. So we're opening up the dura, and uh, we're looking for the facial. So um, facial nerve was was surprisingly um, low. So you expect that it's going to course over the anterior superior portion of the tumor. So you can tell there's something funny about this case, right? The tumor is not the nerve isn't where you expect it to be. Um, we go ahead and start debulking this tumor. And I wish every case went this way, uh, but this this tumor just looked like it wanted to suction right off the 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 other the nervous structures. Um, and uh, I mean, it peeled off of every cranial nerve in the IAC so conveniently. And that should have been a tip off that something was um, unusual. But it, I was still surprised when I saw the pathology. So can anybody guess what this was? So here's the here's the final product. There's a little loop, um, uh, probably a branch of ICA. Um, so this was a meningioma. And so meningiomas, rather than sort of um, becoming really adherent to the facial and to the um, vestibular nerves, they'll kind of push the structures aside. Um, so you know, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have an IAC meningioma that you've mistaken for an acoustic, um, and the patient wants the hearing saved, well, that can be that can uh, that can be a, an easier case than than usual. Um, so again, I'm going to revisit this point. Um, at 10 years, uh, the majority of, of patients will probably lose serviceable hearing if they come in and have hearing to begin with. Um, I, again, I think it, it, this option is particularly favorable for young patients who are motivated to save their hearing. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of uh, 20 year old with a right intracanalicular tumor. Um, this, uh, so here's the Fiesta sequence, and you know, the radiologist is uh, pointing out to us that the facial nerve was coursing over the anterior surface of the tumor. There's a nice fundal cap here, a sort of mid canalicular tumor, uh, and this was about a 10 millimeter tumor. So here's the pre op hearing, it's normal uh, bilaterally. Uh, word recognition score was 100% on both sides, and here's the post-op result. Um, so this this 20-year-old, you know, I, I always, so if, if when I'm talking about this option, you know, I really try hard not to sell it. I really try hard not to do that. In fact, I make a point of saying, you know, the most likely complication of this surgery is deafness. Um, and I tell people that, they should expect to wake up deaf um, in that ear um, because I think that that's the most blunt, um, sort of non biased way of putting it. Um, and, you know, I think when you do that, some patients are going to shy away from it. But I think that's not a bad thing because, you know, you want your patients to be prepared for that possibility. I think this option makes sense for individuals who are motivated to try and who who are also okay with having having the hearing gone 
provided that the tumor is out. And that's a select subgroup of people, right? Um, but I, I feel strongly that it's an option that you should um, at least talk to patients about. So I'm going to show you a retro SIG approach now. So this is um, so this is something that we don't don't um, usually do for intracanalicular tumors. We we will do retro SIG hearing preservation cases for tumors that are larger and that are more um, uh, medially based. So um, just to sort of orient you for a sec, uh, this is a left uh, left posterior fossa. The lowers are down here. Um, brain stems here. Um, so this is a medium sized tumor. Uh, that's a cotton ball uh, within the, the center of the tumor, which we've already started to debulk. And not sure if this is eight or facial or what. This is probably eight. Um, but I'll kind of show you how we do the bony approach for this. <clears throat> so uh, when we start these cases, uh, neurosurgery will start with the CPA tumor debulking. And then the and then we'll kind of come in and um, we'll dam off the posterior fossa with with gel foam, and then peel the dura off the posterior face of the temporal bone. Uh, we'll sort of make like a U-shaped uh, incision through the dura, and peel that dur tumor da uh, dura down to the uh, um, porous, and then trim off the excess. And then we'll kind of do a wide trough across um, the IAC. There's the the porous there. You can kind of see the dura through the bone. And we'll drill, you know, wide uh, superior and inferior troughs. And, you know, for me in my training, like the only time we did retro SIGs was when we were trying to save hearing. Um, so at Vandy, we'll, uh, at Vandy, we'll usually do retro SIGs either for large tumors that where we're trying to save hearing or just large tumors where we're not trying to save hearing. Um, so uh, it was it was interesting to hear from like our fellows when they'd work with different attendings, you know, the uh, different techniques of doing retro SIG for uh, non-hearing preservation cases where you're just, um, you're not even thinking about the inner ear, you're, you're, um, uh, you're purposely going out to the vestibule to get as lateral an exposure as you can. Um, but when we're doing a retro SIG approach for hearing preservation, really the key piece um, of the dissection is finding the um, operculum. And that's what we're going to do here. So I'm sort of back elevating uh, um, the posterior fossa dura and looking for the operculum. You can kind of see like an invagination of the bone there. It's telling me that's that's the neighborhood. I'm knocking on the door. And then I'll take a large uh, caliber or diamond burr and I'll, I'll sort of skeletonize. I want to see the dura of the endolymphatic sac uh, and the duct through the bone, and sort of delineating the course of the duct now. And then I'm going to use that as sort of like a tangent. Um, so I'll find the line that um, makes makes up the duct, and then I'll and then I'll make that the lateral most limit of my dissection. Because if I don't drill lateral to the duct, then I know I'm not going to get into the posterior canal. Um, so that's the idea. And if you do it that way. Um, then it, it usually gets you a pretty wide view of the IAC, but not complete. You usually won't be able to see the, the lateral two to three millimeters of the IAC. And so I'll, I'll show you for this patient what the post-op uh, scan looked like. I don't remember why we got a CT uh, for this patient post-op. I don't know if the patient came back with headaches or not. Um, that might have been what happened. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see there's a little bit of pneumocephalus there. Um, but you can see that this drill out um, was about as complete as we usually expect to have with a retro SIG. So you have about two to three millimeters of bone still covering the, um, the fundus of the IAC. So in general, I think some principles of dissection for these cases. Um, I do think it's it's important to avoid cautery in the IAC when you're doing these cases because one of the challenges is any vessel that you see, you just never 100% sure that it's not the vessel, the uh, auditory artery. And, you know, the auditory artery is a very small vessel, and it's impossible to know um, 
which one's going to be the one. And I think because of that, it's really important to maintain a perfect plane on the tumor when you're dissecting them. So, and, and I've, 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 I've learned this with time. Uh, you know, I, I've been doing this um, at Vandy for almost two years now, and uh, that's not a very long time, obviously, but, but I've noticed for sure that the more I commit to maintaining that plane, the higher the chance is that I'm going to save hearing. Um, and I think the reason for that is because those vessels tend to run in that arachnoid layer. That's where they live. Um, so if you're diligent about maintaining a plane um, that's just underneath that arachnoid and right on the tumor capsule, that's going to be your best bet for saving hearing. And, uh, you know, I've talked to other uh, uh, surgeons who do this a lot who agree with that uh, principle. Um, the other reason I think it protects you is because it, that arachnoid is yet another layer protecting you from the cochlear nerve um, and the facial nerve for that matter. Um, so it's, it's, and that arachnoid plane, once you find it and commit to it, it, a lot of times it peels off very easily, but as you, as you guys know, sometimes that arachnoid layer can look almost inflamed. And I don't know if that's the right word for it, but it can be thick and angry and very hypervascular. And those are more difficult cases, but still possible to save hearing in those cases too. Um, actually, the, the one that I just showed you, the 20-year-old patient, that was in, in fact the case with uh, uh, that patient. The arachnoid was really um, friable, and, uh, but we committed to, you know, it was a slog to setting that tumor out, but it was worth it because he kept his uh, hearing. The other thing is that as you're doing, as you're sort of getting lost in the tumor dissection, it's easy to lose track of the eighth nerve branches. So you got to, as soon as you cut one nerve, you got to have it in your mind that you, <laughs> that you just cut one and then you just cut two, because if you're not careful, you can, you can end up, uh, you know, uh, coming up on the cochlear nerve and, and not realizing that it, that's what it is. So, um, out lateral in the IAC, you can rely on that cochlear nerve being in the sort of antero inferior quadrant of the IAC, but more medially, that cochlear nerve is going to be is you, going to be usually more inferiorly positioned. So it makes a twist um, as it courses out lateral, um, and so you it, that's why it's important to keep track of the vestibular nerves, keep track of the facial nerve. If you're doing a middle fossa, the cochlear nerve is going to usually be the last nerve that you see. Um, and then the other thing is exposure is key. So I told you guys, I always will find at least the the uh, the more medial portion of the labyrinthine uh, segment of the facial nerve. Uh, I want to see Bill's bar. I want, I, because I know that that's going to get me um, as lateral an exposure as I can get with these uh, middle fossa cases. So um, some pearls for middle fossa in particular, uh, it's important to make sure that your exposure is anterior enough, meaning on the IAC, you want to have that drill out, um, be flush with the anterior wall of the IAC, but not be, not more anterior than that, because if you're more than anterior than that, you'll risk entrance into the cochlea. It's a very narrow space between the uh, between the uh, ampullated end of the superior canal, the vestibule, and the uh, and the uh, and the cochlea. It's it's um, it's 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 pr not it's not even three millimeters. It's it's less than that. So that's why we always do that with a two millimeter burr. Um, you also want to make sure that you drill a deep posterior trough, and that can feel uncomfortable drilling inferior um, uh, because you uh, you can't see the, the common cruise when you come up on it. But in general, if you stay sort of tangential to the axis of the superior semicircular canal, you're going to be safe. Um, and I talked about this already. So I'll show you uh, on a cadaver, you know, what is, uh, is I took, my technique for finding the facial nerve is to follow that anterior wall of the IAC uh, as, it, as it comes out lateral. But another way of doing this is to, uh, if you have, if you're, you know, fortunate enough to have a GSPN that's re readily apparent, you can follow it back to the geniculate. Uh, and then follow gen the geniculate and and, uh, uh, follow, and find the labyrinthine segment that way. So I'll show you what that looks like here on a cat cadaveric specimen. I'm going to zoom ahead to um, this part of the dissection. So this is a this is a right ear, and um, what I wanted to show you is right here.
Hold tight, everyone. Not sure if we had some technical difficulties. You guys there? We're here. <laughs> My computer just uh, just died on me. <laughs> it happens. How's that for a technical snafu? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. But um, what I was, wh I'm assuming I cut off when I was talking about um, facial nerve decompression. That's right. Yep. So. Um, you can another technique of doing that is you can follow the GSPN back to the geniculate and then find the labyrinthine segment that way because you know the labyrinthine segment is just going to be posteromedial medial to that geniculate, but uh, you just have to be careful not to not to enter into the cochlea when you do that. Um, so you know that was that was pretty. That's actually <laughs> if there's if there's a convenient time for that to happen, that it was it was around that time of the lecture, but. Um, uh, I we can open it up to questions um, and uh, discussion. Awesome talk, Dr. Uh, Tafik. Thanks so much. Um, and no worries about the the, the computer dying. Um, I've got a couple on hand, but I'll open it up to the floor. Any any questions, discussion, comments? So Kareem, you have a, uh, let's say you have, you personally have an eight millimeter acoustic neuroma with 100% word recognition and SRT PTA of zero. What, what do you want to do? Let's say there's fundal fluid. Yeah. What are you doing for yourself? I think that I would have it out. I really do. I've thought about that a lot. Um, because that's a that's a question that we that we talk about amongst ourselves. The fellows will ask me that question, and um, we've had that conversation more than once. And I really think that at my current age, right? Uh, I think if I were, so if I were if I were you know 75 years old, there's no way there's no way that I'm going to say yes to that proposition. But right now, at this point in my life, if uh, you did an MRI on me and found an eight millimeter tumor, and that were I know my hearing's not that good, by the way, but uh, um, if that were my hearing, I think I would go for it. I really do. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is I just believe that it's probably my best shot at long-term hearing preservation. But, you know, the calculus changes with time. And I, you know, I recognize that everybody, has, and COVID has taught us this too, right? Everybody has a different tolerance for risk. Um, and I think that while it is true that, you know, patients can be swayed by, you know, the nature of the conversation that their surgeons are having with them in terms of risks, like there's talking about risks and then there's talking about risks differently, right? Um, uh, and I do try hard to sort of paint a realistic picture of what I think can happen, um, uh, what I think is likely to happen, not likely to happen. Um, but what to expect. And that's why when I talk to these patients, I'll, I'll always tell them, listen, I think if you're going to do this. You, sh you should know that there's a good chance you could wake up deaf. You should expect that that's going to happen. Um, because I think when you put it that way, it sort of frames the uh, possibility differently in their minds. Teddy, you're a little bit older. How about you? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really tough situation. This is what, you know, patients will ask you this all the time, right? And it's, a, it's always a hard thing to answer. And it's a hard thing to, you know, to really frame it as it's really not my tumor, it's you, right? That's the important thing. 
<clears throat> but, um, you know, I think really, you know, if you look at, you know, Mike Seidman had a really nice meta-analysis that was, uh, came out like two years ago. And if you look at the, you know, of all of the literature, right, um, you know, the hearing preservation uh, rate after five years for microsurgery, you know, gets under 50%, you know, and if you certain kind of more conservative estimates would put it at 30% to 40%. And then, you know, depending on how you kind of look at the numbers, you could squint and say, maybe it's 55%. But it's just hard to know, right? And that doesn't tell you what's going to happen to your case. And I think the other problem is, you know, there's certainly a literature bias, you know, publication bias, where, you know, the people who are publishing, you know, the, uh, the results and outcomes are kind of the world experts, right? I mean, what's going to happen in uh, Rick, Rick and Mark's hands is going to be very different than what might happen in my hands. So, you know, that's so in some ways you could think that's the best case scenario for microsurgery. Then you compare that to kind of the, you know, uh, uh, Sam Gobes also did a, you know, a stereotypic radiosurgery um, meta-analysis on hearing outcomes. And you end up right around 40%, 30% maybe for, you know, 10 years outcome, which doesn't get that much. It's probably the same, right, as, as observation. If you look at the observation data. So for me personally, I kind of say, well, look, if I have actually this probably the same risk of losing my hearing by doing nothing versus doing something, well, gosh, I'll do nothing, right? And so I think that's where I, I lean on it personally. But I think Again, I mean, it all depends on the individual patient and what their expectations are, what their motivations are, and, you know, um, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mallory, how about, how about Mallory? You're a little younger. You're going to have a baby in two months. How's that playing to the equation? <laughs> um, being a surgeon, this is going to sound potentially odd, but I'm wary of any surgery that doesn't have to be done per on a, on a very personal level. And so my, my very quick answer is I would just observe. Um, but I recognize that that's a, you know, extremely personal decision. And my husband on the other hand is probably the exact opposite. Knowing something is there, uh, would drive him, uh, insane. And I think he is, uh, in some respects a little, less risk averse and so would probably go for it i think what one thing that's kind of changed in my you know this is my seventh year right so i haven't been doing it a long time is really the capacity of a, an excellent vestibular therapist to help with the balance problems because for me vestibular problems used to push me in one direction or another but you know when we've you know when we've identified really excellent vestibular therapists throughout the state they've really been able to help with a lot of those patients. So that I kind of will say before I, we push someone to surgery because of balance problems, doing vestibular therapy has been a really a, a game changer in my, in my kind of calculus. But Ted, you're not getting out of this. What's your answer? I'm a little older than you guys. <laughs> um, seven, eight millimeter, how long, how much is it gonna grow and for how long? So I still have good hearing. Yeah, that's the crystal ball that no one knows. Right. Uh, I don't have kids. I have a spouse I need to take care of. Um, you know, what's my, what's my magic number? What's my retirement? What if something happens, et cetera? So all things, all things to think about. 20-year-olds don't necessarily understand risk either. Not really. It's not, <laughs> it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a right or wrong answer, but have a lady with a three centimeter tumor we're taking out in a few weeks who's convinced we're going to save her non-existent hearing um going trans lab and um <laughs> just did somebody on just did surgery on somebody on thursday who right before we rolled back said but you're not going to let me die in the operating room dr meyer are you I said well there's a chance it's low, right? The average person doesn't generally understand math behind risks, unfortunately. But yeah. fun to do, fun to do little tumors on patients, and fun when you can save their hearing. So, yeah, great discussion, yeah. great discussion. Yeah. You know, I uh, I think it was Teddy that said um, that the you're concerned that um, the literature does not necessarily support um, the idea that 
surgical hearing preservation is durable. I personally, I, I'm I'm skeptical about that. I I just I'm not sure that we have a great handle on on that question. You know, I I do think that probably the best uh, the best study is is Talian's study, and you know he he's a he's somebody I trust <laughs> um, uh, deeply, and I think um, and I do I, I'm I, I'd lo love to hear your thoughts, Teddy, about you know do, do you think that it's that it's it is valuable to look at both PT, PTA and word recognition score. Do you think that word recognition score is more important than PTA when you're thinking about what is hearing preservation? What does that actually mean? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And, and as neurotologists, right, we speak out of both of our both sides of our mouths. We say this person has hearing preservation. And then we say that person's also a cochlear implant candidate, right? If you go to two different meetings, you know, they might say one's a cochlear implant candidate and one has, uh, you know, serviceable hearing, depending on yeah. about acoustics versus cochlear. So, you know, I think it's a really good point. I mean, a lot of the arguments that have been made for word recognition being better really don't hold up to kind of, you know, rigorous measurement outcomes. I mean, because if you look at people saying, well, 90 percent. Right. If someone starts off with 90 percent, they're more likely to have hearing preserved than 100 or less likely than 100 percent. Well, the I mean, those are the same exact numbers. If you look at the kind of confidence interval for speech recognition testing, the other major problem is there's no absolutely no rigor in the guidelines for how you present. You know, what's the presentation level right for uh, uh, word recognition? What's the what word list are you using, right? So if you use C and C word lists, right? There's three word lists that actually are known to be more difficult than others, and most you know centers throw them all in together. If you you know what, how many words are you using in that word list? So 25 words versus a 50 word list, you get a completely different confidence interval for kind of. And most places are using 25 word lists, right? You use 25 word lists, you're talking about a, probably about almost a 25 percentage on in each direction for the confidence interval for that. So someone who actually has a 70%, you know, uh, uh, NU6 or, you know, CNC score, he's a 25 word list. Well, the confidence interval includes, you know, class C and class B, right? So it's it's really not done with a lot of rigor. And the other thing, the major thing is the, uh, you know, the other presentation level, what, you know, how, how loud are you presenting it? And is it a realistic listening environment? Um, and then, you know, our data shows that, you know, earphone, so inserts or headphone word recognition scores do not correlate whatsoever with, you know, individuals aided word recognition ability. So the reality is we need to put hearing aids on these people, test them yeah. with their hearing aids to get real, you know, kind of getting a better idea of what their actual, whether they're truly serviceable hearing or not. Because there's a lot of people we call serviceable hearing who probably put a hearing aid on it and they'll hate it. Yeah. So, but there's a benefit to having, you know, some sound recognition, right? From, you know, from a, a sound localization point. So it's not all, you know, even if it's not serviceable, it doesn't mean it's not useful right. to some degree. Well, and I, I think a great point was also made in terms of uh, how well you hear or not, whether your nerve is there and whether it can be stimulated with a cochlear implant. And um, certainly post-radiated tumors, you can use cochlear implants may not do quite as well as non-radiated, but lots of options like that as well, too. So hoping hoping the nerve's there. Um, okay, I'll, or, I'll be negative on that one, too. I hate that being a negative guy. But Cameron Wicks, uh, you know, his CI after acoustic neuroma paper, uh, systematic review, oh, less than 50% of patients had any open set word recognition ability. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, right. So, I mean, it's not, it's not all roses, and there's a lot, I think, a lot no, we no. need to figure out yeah. before we rush ahead, yeah. That's yeah. right. Right. It just it gives you the option of trying it, whether or not it's really going to work. Yeah. I've got an interesting patient where we maintained, you know, pretty uh, kind of a 30 to 40 dB, uh, you know, uh, pure tone uh, thresholds. But he dropped all of his, you know, basically with zero word recognition ability. And he just really can't stand his cochlear implant. So it's really interesting. So we ended up implanting him afterwards. And uh, he really can't, he does not like his implant whatsoever, despite the fact that he's, you know, it's probably the fact that it's, you know, this, this mismatch between his pure tone level and his uh, speech recognition ability. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, you know, all those hearing preservation cochlear implant patients like their device and they use it all the time and they do great with it. 100%. Maybe not.
<laughs> Good discussion, guys. Yeah. Residents, any questions, any thoughts? Any resident going into neurotology has anything to say? Appreciate the very interesting presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, that's awesome, man. The videos are great, too. It's, a, it's so nice that we're finally getting really good, high-quality, high-res videos was, of these that things. That was great. You know, I mean, forever we've been watching these grainy, grainy, terrible videos, so it's really nice. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, hey, how's, how's uh, Lavity doing? Oof. We'll talk about that offline, you know, that guy. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, he's doing great. He's doing great. I think he's finally, I think the fire hose is starting to go down a little bit. Yeah. All right. Yeah, if if Kansas wins tonight, he may be uh, not doing all that well tomorrow. So we will see. So yeah, I, my alma mater is Kansas, so I'll be watching that game tonight too, and I'll be sending him um, a message tonight either way. <laughs> yeah, that's great.